Former Indian envoy to Pakistan and Canada, Ajay Bisaria has uh, written a book and it has come up with some very interesting details of various events that he was privy to. I am in conversation with uh, the former diplomat. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for speaking to NDTV. Thank you for having me. Mr. Bisaria, let me begin with a question uh, that you talk about in terms of policy dilemma against terror and you go on to say that how India's restraint had perhaps sent a wrong message to terrorists and backers in Pakistan. I'm going to quote a part of your book. This is, of course, in the context of 26-11 Mumbai terror attacks. You say that in case India had reacted in 2008 the way it did in 2016 or 2019 with a surgical or airstrike, a strong Indian response would have entered the security calculus of Pakistan and served as a disincentive for the Pakistan Army's support of India-focused militant group, something that you reiterate. Absolutely. I think uh, this has been a dilemma for India, not in recent times, but for three decades, ever since we've started facing terrorism, uh, and I would argue even from the 1980s. The question before India and Indian policymakers is, has been how to react to it. So the argument I make is that perhaps in 2008, India's response was not sufficient, it wasn't adequate, it was over-reliant on diplomacy and not enough reliant on the use of hard power. I make a deeper point that India has suffered uh, terrorism in the 80s in Kashmir, in the 90s, in the 80s in Punjab and then uh, in the 80s and 90s in Kashmir and if we had crafted a response to this subconventional warfare by Pakistan, uh, even earlier, we could perhaps have uh, saved ourselves from a lot of uh, bloodshed and loss of lives. Would you say that there was a reluctance on the part of leadership in 2008 or an over-influence of uh, diplomats? Because you go on to talk about uh, uh, High Commissioner Sat uh, Satyabrata Pal who was uh, in continuous engagement with Pakistan and his counterpart in India, they were peaceniks. So did the government at that time rely too much on diplomats? No, I think that would be oversimplifying it because, you know, diplomats do diplomacy. The question is, uh, what are ki the kind of tools available to you in your whole uh, policy toolkit? And the issue here was, that uh, India uh, had to have both the capacity and the will to be able to make those choices. And the argument is that India now has an answer to Pakistan's subconventional warfare as expressed in 2016 with surgical strikes and 2019 with air strikes, that it is dealing in the subconventional space uh, where you have, you know, uh, a kind of warfare or proxy warfare below the conventional uh, realm of battle. And I think that uh, is something that is going to serve India well in dealing with the Pakistan issue. Uh, you know, even the worst critics of Prime Minister Modi do say that his dealing with Pakistan uh, has consequently resulted in, uh, you know, less terror, uh, acts of terrorism here. And this will be seen as a big success. What do you think changed? Was it... Uh, messaging? Was it tonality? What changed? Well, I think both the capacity and the will changed because uh, what happened uh, in uh, 2016 as an answer uh, to uh, Pakistan's terrorism, India decided to take much stronger steps uh, than it had in both 2016 Uri and 2019 Pulwama. It's not that Prime Minister Modi did not attempt diplomacy. 2014 and 15, remember, was a period when he engaged with Nawaz Sharif. Nawaz Sharif was here for his inauguration, for his swearing-in, and Prime Minister Modi himself made a visit to uh, Pakistan towards the end of 2015. But uh, we finally managed to craft a response uh, to terrorism which entered Pakistan's calculus that uh, this would be a cost that Pakistan would have to pay whether deploying uh, state actors or non-state actors. So you agree that Prime Minister Modi did make an effort, but what was so different in his reaction in comparison to his predecessors, say Dr. Manmohan Singh, 
or Mr. Vajpayee, uh, because backstabbing was something that India had faced in the past as well, every time it dealt with Pakistan. Yes, so I think here you must take in more variables uh, and talk about the compulsions of the times. So I would argue that in Prime Minister Vajpayee's time, uh, he was acutely conscious of the fact that India had gone nuclear in 1998 and there ought to have been a strong nuclear responsibility in dealing with the Pakistan issue and in dealing with the world. And what uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee did uh, was try to understand the nuclear threshold of uh, Pakistan and the red lines. So I, th I feel that by 2008 th th that threshold and those red lines were clearer and therefore we perhaps needed a much stronger response in 2008, the absence of which uh, led to uh, perhaps more acts of terrorism, greater audacity on the part of Pakistan. And uh, the fact that this government took the risk and uh, took it a step forward and uh, took hard action uh, against terrorism uh, is something that is going to stand in their good stead in dealing with terrorism. When do you think India managed to de-hyphenate itself from Pakistan because for the longest time what we had seen was that if any world leader would visit India it will be also with Indo-Pak visiting both the countries. Well I think the dehyphenation moment really came in this century in the end uh, to in 1999 uh, because I think in the perception of world leaders there was uh, South Asia was a trouble spot as you say in the 80s and 90s and, uh, and world leaders who used to visit both countries. But I think what changed in 99 after Cargill was that it became clear to then President Clinton and the Americans that there was a huge difference between uh, one hugely nuclear irresponsible power uh, led by its army chief Musharraf who had uh, uh, come to Cargill and tried a kind of adventure under a nuclear umbrella and India, which was acting with a huge degree of restraint, uh, using both diplomacy and hard power to achieve its objectives. And I think that became fairly clear to the U.S. And that also accounts, I think, for the change in attitude towards India in many quarters. Congress leader, Mr. Bissaria, uh, Rahul Gandhi has said that uh, Western diplomats have told him that the Indian counterparts have become very aggressive, that there is a greater degree of uh, arrogance. You know, many would say that this is a political statement, but as a career diplomat, what really has changed? I think what has changed is a greater degree of confidence. And that confidence comes from the confidence not just in the country and its capacity, but also its leadership and the clear mandates that are available to these diplomats. So now I think uh, Indian diplomats have clearer mandates on what they do and they say and how they interact with their counterparts. They do it with a greater degree of confidence. So I, I would uh, term it confidence rather than use any other adjective. Uh, you know, we have often seen these videos emerge from the streets of Pakistan, uh, which, uh, which is about grudging admiration, one would say. Uh, is that the sentiment that you got before you left Pakistan? Yes, something is changing. There is a change in mood among the people of Pakistan. And I would say that, uh, you know, a large proportion of the population is young. And younger people have fairly common aspirations. They also have common tools and access to common bits of information like social media. And you would see a huge gulf between what the official narrative is in Pakistan and what you would capture in social media and younger Pakistanis talking about it. Okay, uh, talking about Pulwama and uh, you know since you talk about uh, what all happened that day, February 27th to be specific, Wing Commander uh, Abhinandan Vartaman flew MiG-21 and then we saw what really played out. Uh, you know you talk about you being in India and then there was a call that was made to you. Could you elaborate? Yes, so I received a call around midnight uh, from my counterpart, uh, which was Suhail Mahmood, then High Commissioner of Pakistan to India, who happened to be in pa Pakistan in Islamabad, and I happened to be in India because post Pulwama, both of us were pulled in by our governments. And uh, this was a time when um, uh, Balakot had already happened on the 26th, and 
Pakistan had uh, reacted on the 27th and, uh, and the pilot was in uh, Pakistan's custody. So at this point, uh, there was a request uh, that uh, PM Imran Khan wanted to speak to PM Modi. Mm. Uh, f and uh, I, I checked and reverted that uh, the Prime Minister is not available, it's midnight, can you tell me uh, what uh, the issue is and I'm happy to pass on that message. I didn't get a revert on that. But what it demonstrated, I think in, in hindsight and with this whole narrative, is that uh, Pakistan had reason to believe uh, that the uh, threat from India, the, of the credible threat, there was a credible threat of force and that was making it change its behavior, particularly towards returning the pilot. Wing Commander Abhinandan was with Pakistan and still Pakistan was shaking and sweating. Well, I think that episode is available on video. It captures the mood at the moment. It captures the dynamics of the diplomacy and it captures the dynamics of the coercive diplomacy which is that there was a credible threat of force that there would be missiles into Pakistan there would be an escalation by India if Pakistan did not return the pilot and did not change its behavior at that point and that was making Pakistan change its behavior uh, whether in the army or in, in the civilian sector and therefore the pilot was returned to us on schedule uh, unharmed. And I think uh, that's a credit to uh, Indian diplomacy at that point. And you were constantly on call with the then Defense Minister Nirmala Sita Raman. Uh, yeah. What was the conversations like? That's right. And there was a delay. Uh, we were promised that the pilot would cross over around 5 p.m. but he actually did come much later at around 9 p.m. So we weren't sure if if it would happen that day, we would specially kept the Atari border, the Vaga border open, and uh, but the pilot was delivered uh, at 9 p.m. and we all heaved a sigh of relief. So she wanted a very, very frequent updates on what was happening. Did it at any point uh, come to you that maybe Pakistan will go back on its words? Well, you know, nothing can be ruled out. Many, many uh, Indian prisoners uh, have been killed in Pakistan. Stuff happens. So you can't be sure of, uh, of uh, anything 100%. And if that call that came from Pakistan, that uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan wanted to speak to Prime Minister Modi, if that call had happened, what would it have been? Well, you know, I think that's in the realm of conjecture. We, we, can, uh, we can guess. Uh, what could have happened if you uh, even if he'd taken the call or uh, had spoken to each other the Indian ask would have been quite clear please return the pilot or else did you at any point get that sense that the Indian leadership had that will but you had much at stake with wing commander Abhinandan in the custody of Pakistanis well it, you know it is a risk that you take a risk policy makers take and uh, it was clear that India's leadership was coherent in this issue, uh, willing to take risks for getting an Indian citizen out, uh, an Indian soldier out of trouble. And uh, I think uh, the point had been made quite clearly. And I think that only illustrates what uh, Prime Minister Modi said and what then Imran Khan said in his parliament is that uh, there there were these uh, issues, the, the uh, credible threat of force existed and the credible threat of force was understood by Pakistan. Uh, you also talk about uh, your informers in I ISI. Was that because you were a career diplomat who had spent so many years in Pakistan? Well, you know, the way it works in diplomacy is that you develop linkages, you make a lot of friends, it's uh, useful for the ISI to be able to have a channel open to the Indian High Commissioner, it's uh, useful for a diplomat to have that channel open with various power centers. So we use creative diplomacy in, in uh, having friends who have other friends who have other friends and then being able to have these conversations, if not directly, then indirectly. So that's the stuff of what we do. Is, is language of culture really possible at this time when diplomacy has come to a complete halt? Well, certainly, yes, and it shouldn't be ruled out because, you know, you don't rule out anything uh, when you're attempting diplomacy. But 
what it really demonstrates is the paradox and the complexity of dealing with this completely unique adversarial relationship that uh, you have uh, adversarial conversations during the day but if you're meeting in the evening you speak the same language you have the same cuisine you uh, talk of the same culture they love Lata Mangeshkar songs so uh, it's it's completely unique but I think uh, the there is a place for people to people diplomacy and uh, there is a place for cultural diplomacy but you know it has to be calibrated there has to be a certain momentum uh, in the overall relationship to be able to uh, to do that but in Pakistan there's a great deal of latent goodwill for India just as there's a great deal of latent ill will for India and that is the paradox. And that perhaps comes out in the form of videos that we often see. Absolutely, absolutely. You'll see both kinds of videos, the hate ones, but also those uh, filled with admiration about what India is doing. Sir, talking about your expulsion, uh, because it happened in August 2019, post the abrogation of Article 370, and you became the first Indian head of mission to be expelled from Pakistan. Uh, did India's decision to abrogate Article 370 change the equations between the two countries forever? Well, I would argue no, uh, in the sense that Article 370 has been an issue in the relationship from the 50s. You'll see in this book that there was a great deal of anger about Article uh, 370 and how it was being used in the 1950s and again in the 70s and so on. So uh, this was not something dramatically new. <clears throat> and what India was changing was only... Uh, something internal and not the uh, uh, the sort of borders with Pakistan. So I think what uh, was different uh, was that Pakistan uh, didn't quite craft the right diplomatic response for its own benefit. The government of Imran Khan there uh, reacted so harshly that it couldn't find a way of getting off that tiger and uh, then backing down because from what we understood and I try to illustrate that in the book is there was a gulf between the way the civilians were dealing with the situation and the army and in diplomacy you don't sh uh, you know shut doors completely you keep them half open uh, you might want to go back yes I'm going to go back to massacres in Mumbai and there is a paragraph sir where you talk about how you know Indian, India's foreign minister then, Pranam Mukherjee, had expelled his counterpart. Uh, you use the word expulsion and that's the reason why you go on to say that uh, it, it wasn't felt necessary to take any action against Pakistan High Commissioner then, uh, Shahid Malik. I mean, this would be unprecedented for uh, Indian foreign minister to expel his counterpart. What really happened? Well, you know, I use the word playfully. It, technically, that wasn't an expulsion. He wasn't an accredited diplomat in India. But the point is that he was a visiting foreign minister and his counterpart was politely asking him to leave, saying not much purpose will, served, will be served by your staying here. So I think uh, the point I was trying to make was make a comparison between uh, different expulsions at different points of time in this relationship. And uh, often uh, I, I think I would make the overall argument that instead of just managing that anger, we should really be managing our long-term interests and uh, taking care of those. You say that uh, Foreign Secretary Menon had in fact prepared a note which Pranam Mukherjee read and he essentially also goes on to say my official aircraft is available to take you back home whenever you find convenient but it would be desirable if a decision is taken as quickly as possible. If this was a reflection of anger which was largely the national sentiment of doing something then why wasn't anything done? Well, it was an expression of anger. Uh, the, uh, he was expelled, but I make the argument that it wasn't enough. It was not enough in managing India's long-term interests. Uh, it was great optics. It was uh, an expression of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of disapproval, dismay, but it was not enough uh, to take care of India's interests, to act as a deterrent for future uh, Mumbai-like attacks to happen in India. And in, with perfect hindsight, I feel that uh, we should have trusted our first instincts of taking hard action and imposing a cost on the uh, Pakistan army. Surgical or airstrikes after, pa after Mumbai 
these would have made for stronger disincentives for uh, later attacks by Pakistan in Pathan Kot, Uri and Pulwama. So you are of the opinion it would not have happened. Well, I'm of the opinion that a policy stance of active defense, which we have now, is something that we needed to have way earlier. We, uh, at least late by a decade, if not by several decades. Because uh, India did not find an answer to Pakistan's subconventional warfare. It's proxy warfare in Punjab, it's proxy warfare in Kashmir. India did not have a good answer for that. In Kargil, India had an answer that was almost in the conventional realm. But India didn't have a good answer for terrorism, which it does now, because it has entered Pakistan's calculus that any uh, act of terrorism uh, will have a response from India. And the next Pulwama will be Balakot Plus. Former uh, Pakistan Prime Minister who is in jail has spoken about the February elections and he has said uh, that it could be a disaster or a farce. Uh, Nawaz Sharif is back on the political horizon in Pakistan uh, and he could very well contest because that ban has been removed. What do you think is happening in Pakistan? Well, lots of interesting things. Uh, in Pakistan, it's always, uh, always impossible to predict, uh, you know, what exactly will happen because there are so many twists and turns. But I think the big picture is that Pakistan from 2021 is going through a poly crisis. There is a huge political crisis, uh, which we talk about and which we see, but there's an underlying huge economic crisis as also a security crisis from, uh, from Afghanistan, from the TTP. So uh, what we are seeing now is that Project Imran, which was a project of the army, has been shelved in favor of Project Nawaz because uh, project Imran became uh, too hard to handle. He had to be put in jail. And now the trouble is that Project Nawaz hasn't gathered enough steam. So there isn't this spontaneous popularity for Nawaz Sharif and there is this uh, dangerous from their point of view, from the point of view of the establishment, popularity of Imran Khan. He's claiming 70-80%. But whatever it is, uh, it, uh, they would like to manage this election to have a selection of Nawaz Sharif and until that is assured, uh, elections are not assured. Among the next generation of uh, potential leaders, uh, what about Bilawal Bhutto? You must have heard about him or interacted with him at some stage. What, what did you sense? Yes, I've met him and uh, he's a politician who's learning, who's evolving. Uh, and um, he certainly needs to be watched out in the future because uh, in, the, in the coming decades, uh, his, he has a strong, his party has a strong power base in Sindh and also a bit in, in Punjab. But uh, he's a politician to watch out for, as is Mariam Nawaz, because this will be the newer generation of uh, politicians. But hopefully they'll, uh, they'll come, on their, uh, come up on their own and begin to understand that uh, they need to take independent stances and you know, deepen Pakistan's democracy rather than just play the game of trying to be favorites of the establishment. Mr. Basaria, anger management. Uh, would you have named this book a little different, perhaps a different title, had you not been Indian envoy to Pakistan, perhaps any other country? Well, you know, there is a good deal of anger and a good deal to manage it in several uh, relationships. Uh, somebody sent a joke with me that why don't you write a book on, Pakistan, on Canada now? And I said, well, I could use the same title. Because, so that will be the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> because the fact is that uh, in adversarial relationships there is uh, 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 some degree of anger. And I think if, if there's a policy advocacy here, it is to say that uh, instead of managing our passions and dealing with issues with uh, passion and, you know, kind of short-term goals, uh, let's deal with them keeping our long-term interests in mind. All right. Thank you so much for speaking to NDTV, sir. Thank you very much.